So my, my finger, I almost sliced it off with a mandolin. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm Bobby Flay. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> I have nine stitches, so. Oh, geez. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I hope whatever you were making was good and not too bloody. <laughs> <laughs> I was slicing carrots and I had to throw them away because they were covered in blood, so. Anyway, I think maybe we should go ahead and get started. It's already 12.01. So uh, welcome everybody and thank you for uh, participating in the research and uh, innovation conference of the Department of Medicine. Uh, my name is Sonia Flores and I am a professor in the pulmonary division and I'm also the vice chair for diversity and justice in the department. And I will be moderating uh, this session. And it happens that both of these uh, colleagues of mine I've known for a very long time and even published together. And so again, it, it's, it's a very, uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to moderate this. So uh, for all of those who have any questions, you may actually write your questions on the chat box or even better, if you raise your hands, then I will call on you and then you can unmute and start your video and ask the question. I think it's that's a little bit more intimate if we do it that way. So um, let's, let, let's go ahead and get started. And I just want to introduce our first speaker who is Dr. Meredith Tennis. Dr. Tennis is an associate professor in the pulmonary division. So again, we've known each other for a very long time. And she actually uh, graduated from Gonzaga University with a bachelor's degree and obtained her PhD at Georgetown, Georgetown University in Washington, DC, a beautiful area. But she did her postdoctoral fellowship here at UC uh, Denver and has been with us since then and now is an associate professor in the pulmonary division. Uh, she's been funded uh, via R01s and R21s and her research actually has revolutionized the field of non-small small lung cell carcinoma. Uh, so her research uh, focuses on understanding uh, premalignant lung lesions, investigating lung cancer, interception and identifying markers for targeted application of chemo prevention. Her team actually was instrumental in discovering that uh, win, uh, the wind frizzle 9 pathway is a critical pathway and plays a critical role in uh, the genesis and even in, in the anti-tumor genesis in uh, uh, lung cancer. So Dr. Tennis, please take it away. Thank you, Sonia. Let me share. All right, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you um, for that introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk about um, this project. Um, we are looking at ex vivo modeling of lung cancer and chemo prevention. And I wanted to start just by um, mentioning the team that's worked on this. Um, Kayla is um, a PRA headed for medical school who's been involved in, in the entire project. Um, Alex is a PRA who's in graduate school who um, initiated some of the work. And then um, Preeti was a PRA who's been involved in different aspects. And Lori Neald, who's now retired, um, was really instrumental in um, getting mouse work um, started for this project. And we collaborate with Chelsea Megan's lab. Um, Rachel Blomberg is a, a postdoc who's been um, leading a lot of this work. And Duncan is a grad student who did some of the initial studies. So this project started um, with us thinking about mouse models of lung cancer. Um, and we wanted to ask more questions and find new ways to explore chemo prevention and pre-malignancy um, in our models. So there's really three um, models um, of lung cancer in mice. Um, orthotopic models are a great way to study tumors and metastasis. Genetically engineered models are a great, great way to study genetics and tumors. Um, but really, when we're talking about um, chemo prevention and pre-malignancy, we're using chemical models. Um, and this allows us to look at initiation and promotion and, and understand the early biology. So chemical mouse models of lung cancer um, can induce adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And the great thing about these models is they mimic the progression of disease in humans. So we can see early lesions all the way through um, carcinomas. In, for adenocarcinoma, um, these uh, models typically use tobacco carcinogens, either whole tobacco smoke or components such as urethane or nitrosamines. 
Um, for squamous cell carcinoma, um, this has been a, a pretty big challenge. And, and right now, NTCU is a chemical that, um, uh, the only one really that um, is found to induce squamous lesions. Um, but it's a really long sort of traumatic model. Um, and recently we published a paper where we combined NTCU with cigarette smoke um, to shorten the model. Um, so while these models are really good for studying the earliest stages of lung cancer, um, they do have some challenges. So they generally have a really long latency. A, a tobacco smoke model can be 40 plus weeks. The NTCU alone model is 30 plus weeks. Um, so it takes a long time and typically the number of tumors are, are small. Um, there's a lot of variability depending on mouse strain, um, mouse handling, and then even chemical lots can sort of change the outcome of your study. These can also be very stressful for animals and technicians, um, both because of the length and also, you know, some of the studies require daily application of, of chemicals, which can um, be stressful. When we look at chemo prevention, if we're interested in screening chemo prevention because of the small number of um, lesions or tumors, it requires a lot of animals. And then when we wanna look at mechanistic questions, it can get complicated with different transgenic um, or knockout models on top of chemical carcinogens. So in order to address some of these challenges, we started thinking about a precision cut long slice model. Um, and this is a, a summary diagram from a review showing the many potential applications of precision cut lung slices. We can uh, model different diseases, um, look at disease mechanisms, cell-cell interactions. You can molecularly profile the tissues, um, and you can also look in um, for secreted components in the media of um, the cultures. And you can do this in pretty much um, any species that has lungs. Um, and so we're particularly interested in mouse um, and human tissue. <clears throat> so as a simple example of how this model works, um, we have um, either harvested lungs from mice or uh, pieces of resected lungs from humans that's filled with agarose so they can be sliced on a vibratome. And then they're put into culture where they can be treated with drugs, they can be transduced. Um, a lot of different manipulations can occur in culture. And then when the culturing is done, the tissues can be used for protein extraction. They can be fixed. You can do all different kinds of cell health assays. And then you can also extract um, nucleic acids and do PCR or sequencing. For an example of what this looks like in real life, this is from our um, mouse tissue where we have the um, lungs um, extracted from or harvested from the mice and then filled with agarose. Um, we make 500 micron slices with a vibratome. And then for our purposes, um, we wanted to create a more uniform piece of tissue. So we use a four millimeter biopsy punch. Um, and this allows us to get about 20 to 30 punches um, per mouse. And then each punch is cultured in its own well and can be subject to different conditions. So thinking about PCLS for lung cancer, um, it could be very useful because uh, PCLS can maintain the structure, metabolism, and all the cellular components um, of the lung. But very few studies have been done um, in lung cancer with PCLS, and those have really been limited to tumors. So there are a couple studies um, that resected human tumors and looked at whether they could deliver drugs and then looked at T cell motility within the tumor. Um, and same with mouse tumor lung tissue, um, where they compared slices to in vivo um, tissue and tried delivering different drugs to um, tumors. So we're interested um, in, at the beginning, in comparing our PCLS cultures to our historical data from our in vivo models. So um, initially, um, we looked at um, just normal wild type mouse tissue. This is an example of um, an H&E um, showing what the, the tissue often looks like. And then we can measure viability um, with a Presto Blue metabolism assay. And in this graph, um, the black bars are um, just normal untreated tissue. And when we look, when we compare day seven to day zero, we can see that we're able to maintain viability across over about a week. And since we're also interested in chemo prevention, we've done a lot of in vivo studies with the drug Iloprost. Um, we've used this in our PCLS um, to compare with in vivo um, experiments. 
And here um, we have the vehicle and Ilopras. And again, across seven days, we were able to maintain viability of these tissues, even with treatment. We also looked at gene expression that we, um, we knew from our in vivo studies. So again, treating our PCLS with vehicle or Ilopras. Um, and Ilopras is known to um, increase expression of epithelial um, genes and decrease expression of mesenchymal genes. And so here we saw um, in our PCLS, we did have increased expression of ECAT hearing with Ilopras treatment and decreased expression of mesenchymal genes. Um, we also use um, a Frizzled 9 knockout model to do um, experiments with Ilopras. And basically, the Frizzled 9 um, knockout mouse has sort of the opposite um, gene expression of Ilopras treated mice. So in our PCLS that came from wild type compared to Frizzle 9 knockout mice, we saw a decrease in e herin and a slight increase in um, snail environment. And so we know that we can um, measure gene expression and that it's comparable to our in vivo models. We also wanted to look at signaling. And so again, using Ilopras, we know that um, Ilopras activates a PPAR gamma response element in vivo. And um, when we measured activity of, of the PPAR gamma response element in the PCLS with Ilopras treatment over six days, we saw an increase in activity. We also um, treated our PCLS um, with LPS to look for an inflammatory response. And in both our wild type and frizzle nine knockout mice, um, compared to our control, we saw an increase in gene expression related with um, um, LPS-induced inflammation. So we also think that we can measure um, signaling that um, is um, parallel to what we see in vivo. So another um, sort of angle that we were interested in was um, looking at uh, pre-malignant lesions that were induced in vivo and seeing whether um, those tissues responded the same um, as we would expect um, in vivo. So we treated mice um, in vivo with urethane to induce an early adenocarcinoma lesions. And then we sliced the lungs and ex vivo treated them with vehicle or iloprost. So what you see here are saline in vivo, urethane in vivo, vehicle or ilo ex vivo, and vehicle or iloprost ex vivo. And when we look at viability, we see a little bit of a dip here, but a but still maintains over 50% um, viable cells in the culture. And then um, we also looked at the PPAR gamma response element activity, which typically we see decrease with urethane and increase with iloprost. This data was a bit more variable, um, but we did sort of um, see a trend to um, where iloprost increased PPR activity um, and then with um, urethane treated mice, we either had uh, not a big change or a little bit of a decrease. Um, but this uh, is the beginnings of um, looking at um, hopefully pre-malignant lesions that are induced in vivo and then uh, manipulated ex vivo. Since we're also really interested in chemo prevention agent development um, beyond our, our favorite drug, Ilopras, um, we also put some other um, developing chemo prevention agents on um, wild type PCLS to see um, if we could maintain viability and um, measure expected downstream um, gene expression changes. And we did see um, a little bit um, of a decrease in viability with um, curcumin and budesonide. Um, and again, uh, these doses, um, we are extrapolating from uh, animal studies. So it's possible that, that these are too high and that potentially we could maintain better viability with a slightly lower dose. But we also measured known downstream um, targets of both of these drugs um, and saw expected decreases here for curcumin and then um, in one of the downstream um, targets here for budesonide. So again, just um, supporting that um, we can, um, over a seven to 10 day culture, maintain viability and signaling um, when we treat with uh, both carcinogens um, in vivo or when we treat with chemo prevention agents ex vivo. So there are some limitations of um, these studies with PCLS 
um, and lung cancer. So there was a study that looked at KRAS tumors um, that were sectioned for PCLS and saw that they fairly quickly lost um, the signaling that they were expected to have. Um, and there, there have been some other um, studies just looking at normal lung tissue um, and their culture time um, is fairly short in terms of um, maintaining um, different uh, metabolic pathways, maintaining vessels. Um, so there is a limitation of short culture time, which for lung cancer is important because as you all know, um, in humans and in mice, lung cancer takes a while to develop. And so we probably need longer culture times in order to do the kinds of studies that we wanna do. So while we were thinking about this, um, Chelsea Magan's lab published um, this paper where they um, were embedding precision cut lung slices in a hydrogel to support um, extended ex vivo culture. So in this, um, in figures from this paper, you can see um, in A, the green lung slice um, enveloped in this um, hydrogel. In B, they looked at viability using the same um, Presto Blue assay, and they tested a number of different hydrogel formulations, but across them all, um, were able to maintain um, viability out to 21 days, um, depending on the condition. And then they also um, looked at immunofluorescence um, for ECAD here to um, show the maintenance of, um, of lung cell structure. Um, so at day 21 here on the bottom, you can see in the hydrogel um, embedded tissue, um, there's better um, maintenance of um, e cadherin expression and structure there. So they also um, looked at whether uh, molecules could cross through the hydrogel into the tissue. So here they looked at fluorescein, which is um, a small hydrophobic molecule, and then dextrin, which is a large hydrophilic molecule, and both of them moved through the hydrogel um, and into the tissue as evidenced by this increase in um, measurement in the tissue. They're also able to um, formulate their hydrogel to mimic the stiffness of mouse lung. So um, in this graph, you can see that there's um, a comparison between mouse lung and one of their um, hydrogel conditions, and um, there's no difference between the two. So all this was really exciting. Um, and, you know, the demonstration that they could have longer term cultures that they could mimic um, mouse stiffness was exactly um, what we needed. And right at this same time, um, the National Cancer Institute released um, an RFA for cancer biologists and bioengineers to work together. So it was sort of perfect timing. Um, and we proposed um, two aims in an R21 to look at um, differences in uh, to look at different hydrogel formulations and whether they could support development of lesions ex vivo, and then also to look at the effects of uh, chemo prevention agents. So um, one of the first things we did was see if we could get these um, PCLS to be viable even longer. Um, and so we um, tried one hydrogel formulation and had viability out until day 37, um, suggesting that um, we might have a long enough window to induce pre-malignant lesions in these cultures. So to start looking um, at adenocarcinoma, this is just an example of um, h &E's from lesions through um, the very earliest hyperplasia um, all the way to adenocarcinoma um, in a mouse. And um, the, we're most likely to be able to induce hyperplasias um, in our mouse model, but Visualizing them um, may be challenging. And so we're really hoping to see adenomas um, in, in our modeling. So we started with a six week exposure of our precision cut lung slices to urethane, which is um, a, a um, carcinogen that induces adenocarcinoma in our mouse models. And um, we got good viability, um, but really no obvious lesions. Um, with exposure to urethane. And this is just an example of um, H&Es from uh, our punches after they've been sectioned. And we do have a little bit of a challenge with sectioning an art of potential artifact, um, but you can see here some of the hydrogel that's sort of left still on the section. Um, and also you can see that we, um, we can um, do a fairly good job of maintaining um, structure and morphology in these um, slices. 
So um, because the urethane didn't seem to work very well, um, we decided to try vinyl carbamate, which is a, um, the final metabolite of urethane. So we did six weeks um, ex vivo vinyl carbamate exposure. Um, and in this top graph, we were able to maintain viability with two different doses of vinyl carbamate. Again, extrapolating from in vivo studies on what the potential right dose is um, for vinyl carbamate. So we did this experiment to test, first we actually did it with higher doses and it killed everything. But um, So here we were testing lower doses. We were optimizing some of our endpoint assays and sectioning. Um, and we had good viability. And then we also did a live dead assay and um, possibly you know, saw a few of these sort of green areas of proliferation that could be developing um, lesions. So um, after this, the next step um, was to do six weeks of vinyl carbamate testing four different hydrogel conditions, um, looking at proliferation, looking at gene expression changes, and also looking for KRAS mutations, which um, are uh, induced by urethane um, in vivo. So we're also interested in squamous carcinoma. This is an example of progression of lesions um, in a mouse. Um, this is a lot more challenging um, of a model um, in vivo, um, but it turns out it's also going to be pretty challenging ex vivo. So we did six weeks of NTCU. Um, we saw decent viability, um, but we saw none of the expected gene expression changes, no evidence of lesions. Um, and we hypothesized that NTCU may not be metabolized. And we also um, know from um, my colleague Momita Ghosh's work that um, tracheal basal cells may be the cell of origin for squamous carcinoma in a mouse. So we may also just not have the cells that are gonna respond um, immediately to NTCU. So, um, the things that we're working on right now, so as I mentioned, our, our next step was to do this six week, another six week vinyl carbamate experiment, which we just finished last week. Um, and it has some really promising data um, with proliferation and um, gene expression. And so we're actually um, getting ready to start the next experiment where we'll pick sort of what we think is the best hydrogel formulation. Um, and then we'll have a lot of punches dedicated to HNEs and immunofluorescents to really look for lesions in as many punches as we can. Um, we're also, um, again, interested in whether we can um, culture in vivo induced lesions. So this is an example of um, in vivo urethane. Um, and then uh, the lungs were harvested for PCLS and sectioned. And you can see these adenomas. Um, that were in short-term culture and then um, the tissues were sectioned. So um, we think we can culture adenomas. We need to do this in a long term um, out to six weeks and see you know, whether they're maintained, whether they grow or regress, if we can treat them with chemo prevention agents. And um, when we think about squamous lesions, um, inducing them in vivo and then um, experimenting on them ex vivo is probably the only way we're going to be able to do PCLS with um, NTCU. So hopefully um, we'll be able to do those experiments and see some of our in vivo induced lesions in our ex vivo model. So there's a lot of applications um, of hydrogel embedded PCLS for lung cancer that we're thinking about. Um, in the mouse, we can do chemo prevention drug discovery um, that would be really challenging and expensive in um, the in vivo models. So sort of do some pre preclinical models. We can investigate pre-malignant lesion development and the biology of that is um, when we have our hydrogel embedded model optimized. And I think we could also do some interesting work looking at the microbiome effects on pre-malignant lesion development or chemo prevention response, which nobody has um, really looked into yet. So um, if there's anyone out there who loves microbiome and wants to collaborate, I'd love to um, think about some of the possibilities there. Um, we're also starting to work on human lung PCLS. Um, again, hoping we can induce and study premalignant biology in human tissue. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to look at comorbidity. A lot of PCLS models have been optimized with fibrosis or COPD. Um, potentially, we could induce premalignant lesions in uh, these already diseased lungs and think about um, what happens when both diseases are present. Um, we can do chemo prevention drug testing. There's a possibility that we can get um, tissue with premalignant lesions in it. Um, 
we can also look at therapy and resistance um, in tumor uh, PCLS, and then think about biology of tumor adjacent tissue, which is a little easier to get, um, but looking at how the environment is affecting those pre-malignant lesions. So a lot of things that we're really um, excited about doing with this model. Um, and that's all I have, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tennis, for that fascinating talk. And I'm glad to see that th these uh, precision cut lung slices actually can be used uh, ex vivo to query a lot of what's happening in vivo. So um, I, I, don't, I don't see if anybody has a question, but... Um, I always oh, have Jane, a question. Sure. No, so, and I, I was going to ask the question too. So go ahead, Jane. Yeah. So, so um, one of the points that you made uh, about mid talk and something that I'm really interested in is the matching of the stiffness of the uh, of the microenvironment that you've created. Can you talk a little bit more about how that allows you to bring out the the real phenotype that you might see in vivo? Well, we know, I mean, we know a little bit from the literature um, that the stiffness around well around tumors, we don't know as much for premalignant lesions, but it changes in the lung. Um, and so our hypothesis is that there may be a different um, stiffness or we're also um, um, changing the collagen concentrations and that, you know, there may be differences in there that would be better at promoting um, a particular um, progression of a lesion or development of a lesion. And so that's sort of what we're testing with these different hydrogel um, formulations is whether any of those are more likely to, um, to allow us to induce a lesion. Um, so that's really what we're testing. Yeah, no, it, it's very exciting. And I think, you know, all cells like where they live and they and so it's really important to try to recapitulate that environment. And it's, it's, a, it's a really cool idea. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Rouge. And I have a question, Meredith. So I think it was one of your earlier slides when you were introducing the ex vivo model um, where you're showing the viability by measuring metabolic activity. And I was struck by the fact that there, there seemed to be an increased uh, metabolic activity after seven days. Can you comment yeah. on what do you think is going on there? So that was that was with Isloprost. Um, and well, actually it was all the mm -hmm. conditions in that. And we do see some variability in the assay that we haven't been able to explain yet. Um, and there may be some, unfortunately, some user differences um, in that assay. Um, so, I don't know if that's because of biology um, or, you know, because of, of technical issues, because generally we either see maintenance or a decrease, whether Iloprost has some, you know, protective effect from inflammation, which we know it, you know, it affects inflammation. It's possible that it's somehow increasing viability, um, but we haven't, you know, we haven't dug into those differences really. Yeah, and again, I mean, I don't know if there's something uh, different about growing these slices ex vivo that maybe increases mitochondrial activity or something like that, which would be really interesting. Yeah. And kind of along the same lines of Jane's question, and you alluded to that in terms of what Momita Ghosh has found, I would think that where you, um, where you harvest uh, the punches from, would be absolutely critical, right? I mean, how do you make sure that you really do have a representative sample of the entire lung or even right. the airways? Right, so when, um, when we're talking about adenoc adenocarcinoma, it's a little easier, right? We can punch around the edges and it's, the squamous is a, is a lot more challenging. And we actually, um, for that NTCU experiment that we did, we used whole slices instead of punches. So we knew that there would be airway um, in every well. Um, and that's something we sort of gone back and forth with about how to set up those assays. Um, and we even attempted a tracheal lung PCLS, which was, we haven't, we haven't figured that out yet, but, but, you know, if, if we do need those tracheal cells, this NTC is probably never going to work in cultures. So, um, there's a lot on the squamous side. It's challenging in every aspect of lung cancer. So. 
But it's really exciting work. So thank you so yeah. much for this wonderful presentation. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Jane Rouge. Dr. Rouge is a professor uh, in the Division of Endocrinology, Endocrine, Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes. I always have problem with multi-syllabic <laughs> words. Um, so Dr. Rouge actually got her uh, undergraduate degree from, oh my gosh, I had it here, uh, from Notre Dame and another Catholic school. And uh, she went to medical school at Northwestern and the University of Minnesota, but then she moved here and her professional career actually has been spent here. And so we're so lucky to have her. Her research is, um, uh, the focus of her research is uh, identifying cellular and molecular mechanisms like mitochondrial dysfunction and blood vascular inflexibility that limit resilience in diabetes. And I have to say also that she has been the co-director of uh, with Judy Regensteiner of uh, the women's uh, uh, health program here. And uh, she's the consummate physician scientist. Again, and when I worked with her many, many years ago, I mean, she really was very much engaged in a lot of molecular studies, but she's gone all the way from very basic research to actually clinical translational aspects. Again, incredibly illustrious career, in a lot of uh, recognitions and honors, too many to mention. So again, uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Rouge. Jane, take it away. Well, so um, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to be part of this, um, of this really important conference where we talk about, about the research that people are doing on campus within our Department of Medicine. And I've got a couple logistical things to try and hide, get myself out of the way here. Um, and I'm gonna take a bit of a different pitch today because the body of work that, that I've been working on um, with so many colleagues over the last uh, 25 years here on the faculty has been uh, doing something that we all talk about, but sometimes we don't talk about what we mean by it which is to use translational research to ask big questions. So the big question we're addressing is the mechanisms of exercise intolerance in diabetes. And diabetes is very important because even from the time in 2018, when I was president of the American Diabetes Association, um, when there were 30.3 million people in the United States living with diabetes, it has increased to 37.3. So we really need to understand what's going on. And the first aspect I want to mention about translational research is that you, in order to ask questions that move from bedside to bench to back again, you need a diversified research funding portfolio. When you first have an idea of how you might repurpose an existing mechanism, you might use an investigator initiated trial support. Later, when you have sound preliminary data and a very big question, then you will be able to secure NIH or VA funding. Always you want to be leveraging the associations that are interested in the questions that you're asking. For us, that's the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, and the Juvenile uh, Diabetes Research Foundation. And when you do team science, you need uh, an incredible village of collaborators, because particularly as a physician scientist who is an MD scientist without a PhD, though I have done years and years of, of molecular and cell biology and protein chemistry, I knew from the very to collaborate with clinical colleagues, as well as, as, well as colleagues with expertise at the bench. And as my questions evolved, answering one question may move me to needing absolutely new techniques. And so I would need to establish newer collaborations where Jefferson Frisbee and David Wasserman and Zheng Chi Lu are some of our most recent newer collaborators. So what is the big question that I'm trying to ask? So in a few decades long collaboration with Dr. Judy Reagan Steiner, who is the director of the Ludeman Family Center for Women's Health Research, and an anthropologist and expert in exercise physiology, 
She came to me in the mid 90s and said, I really want to know if diabetes is interfering with functional exercise capacity. So those of you who are diabetes aficionados may note that this hemoglobin A1C is maybe doesn't make much sense, but either way, what we found was that if you looked at people with relatively new onset of type two diabetes and no complications, and these are women, relative to sedentary obese controls, sedentary lean controls, all, all individuals sedentary, the people with diabetes had a very low maximal exercise capacity. And even after four months of exercise training, the people with diabetes had, had a similar low level of exercise to ca capacity to obese control subjects who, um, who, 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 were, who were sedentary. Now, at that moment in history, I wasn't so sure that most of my patients might, might exercise to maximal exercise capacity, right as we were publishing this work. One of many studies came out demonstrating that if I measure your functional status at day one, and this is 1,400 healthy men, and follow your mortality over the next 15 years, people with low level of functional exercise capacity have a higher mortality by a very substantial 30% over 15 years. And these are not old men, these are younger men. Similar data, were presented with people with, di with diabetes from this same group. And as we were further exploring this phenomenon, what we found is that women will always have a lower maximal exercise capacity than men, but women with diabetes had a greater decrement and women with diabetes suffer more cardiovascular complications than women without diabetes, even in the pre-menopausal age group. So this seemed to us to be very important. And then in collaboration with a rock star uh, pediatric endocrinology colleague, Dr. Kristen Nadeau, we found that children, and now this new um, uh, burgeoning epidemic of children with type 2 diabetes presenting in adolescence, had a very low, uh, very major decrement in their maximal exercise capacity. And also children with type one diabetes had a, a lower exercise capacity, which Irene Schauer was able to demonstrate also happened in adults with type one diabetes. And what was really intriguing was that there was this tight correlation between glucose disposal or insulin sensitivity and this exercise phenotype. So what I've just told you is that there is decreased functional exercise capacity in newly diagnosed adults and youth with type one and type two diabetes, and this has implications for longevity. So what has been has emerged over the last over the last few decades is that regardless of what your background is, if you have a very low level of functional status whether you have hypertension or a number of other diseases, you will have a doubling of your mortality. And this is just the range that these 40 year old women had that we studied. So this is a very compelling argument that we should learn more about this. So why might it be? And, and, and why would exercise capacity be such a potent, the most potent predictor of longevity? And it's because exercise capacity is really the most elegant form of systems biology. When you present a stress to, to, to a whole organism, then the lungs and the circulating blood and the heart and the skeletal muscle and the organelles within the heart, lung and skeletal muscle all need to be able to respond to that exercise stressor with an integrated response. So if you have a hiccup at any place along this comprehensive system, you may have decreased functional status. And that is why this represents a composite of health and if it's low, risk. So the questions that we're asking are what are the physiological mechanisms leading to decreased exercise capacity in diabetes? And what I really wanna highlight for you today is the idea of how we used a translational approach to get at this question. So we used people for our initial observation, then we went to cells, animal models, and back and forth. So we had this, idea, we had this observation that glucose disposal or insulin sensitivity 
correlated impeccably with exercise capacity in people with and without diabetes, but these are actually data from children with diabetes. So we said, well, if that's true, can we use an insulin sensitizer? And at this point in history, we chose rosiglitazone. And we found that when we compared women again with and without diabetes, um, uh, I mean, both with diabetes uh, versus a placebo, the people treated with the insulin sensitizer improved their functional exercise capacity. This seems like a holy grail, a pill for exercise. These people also gained five pounds because insulin sensitization will, will be associated with weight gain, but it gave us this proof of concept that we could use mechanistic insights to come up with ways to target this functional status impairment. So how would it work that insulin sensitizing might improve this? Well, um, as, 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 as Dr. Flores uh, noted, I was a basic scientist and cell biologist um, uh, solely actually for the first 10 years of my time as a physician scientist. And so we went to the concepts of cell biology. So insulin action acts through um, AKT and the PI3 kinase pathway. This is the pathway that's specifically disrupted in diabetes. Um, and exercise acts through the AMP kinase pathway and is modulated by NAD. Um, and both converge on nitric oxide synthase. So nitric oxide synthase will vasodilate uh, blood vessels. It's the classic thing you give, uh, generates nitric oxide. Um, and so that is very potent for getting systemic blood flow going. But one of the things that was discovered right around the time we really began to try to unravel this was that nitric oxide is a potent upstream regulator of PGC1 alpha and one of my favorite transcription factors, CREB, um, and these are regulators of mitochondrial biogenesis. So not only might, might nitric oxide synthase be, be modulating mitochondrial function and dynamics, but it may also modulate blood flow. So we thought this is a critical thing because we know that in insulin resistance, nitric oxide synthase doesn't work. We then followed this with some animal studies where we either had uh, deleted nitric oxide synthase or, or uh, pharmacological inhibi inhibition of nitric oxide synthase. And we showed that same phenotype we'd seen in people, which I'm gonna show you in a few other diabetes models on the next slide which is that if I compare, this is a genetic rat model of, of, of insulin resistant diabetes, we see a lower baseline response, um, exercise capacity, and a, and, a, and a diminished overall response to exercise training, while they still have a response to exercise training. All right. Similarly, if we just age rats in a cage, we can create metabolic syndrome, and we have that same or a similar phenotype. So we thought we can use this animal model that doesn't that 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 at least uh, improves its exercise capacity, but doesn't respond all that well from a molecular transducers of exercise uh, benefit, um, and and see and see whether targeting nitric oxide synthase might be something we could do. So if the target is nitric oxide synthase. What is a potential tool that we could repurpose? And as a clinical um, a diabetologist, I'm, I'm frequently using GLP-1s. GLP-1s uh, target a, a G-protein coupled receptor, which increases cyclic nucleotides and stimulates NOS. So it kind of gets around that blockage in the PI3 kinase pathway. And so we thought that th these agents might converge to give you an adaptive response to exercise training. And what we saw was just that. If we looked at, at upstream regulators of mitochondrial biogenesis, AMP kinase, NOS signaling, and PGC1 alpha, we saw a fabulous response, and this is in the aorta. We saw an induction of a sort of composite of OXFOS um, uh, subunit proteins. But this is all in the aorta. We were interested in the aorta at the time, but what about exercise capacity? Well, in a lovely experiment Dr. Amy Keller did, she, she just gave an agent, a very modest agent, a, a DPP-4 inhibitor, which increases circulating GLP-1 and saw a, a nearly a doubling in the exercise response to the intervention. 
So we wanted to know if that was really going via GLP-1 itself. So Becky Scalzo did a set of experiments where she used a GLP-1 receptor antagonist and showed that same phenotype that we see in people, less baseline um, functional activity, as well as less response, adaptive response to exercise training. So we thought, well, this is exciting. We're on to it. And this is where being a translational scientist comes in. We took this straight to the humans in our partnerships with industry. And uh, oh, first we, we, we checked more about these rats and we found that they had uh, left ventricular hypertrophy when they were exposed to this and it actually got worse when, when they exercise trained. We found that their pulse wave velocity or their, or their aortic uh, functional stiffness was greater. And in the animals that were exposed to the receptor antagonist, when they did exercise training, their arteries got more stiff as opposed to getting less stiff when, when, um, when the control animals were exposed to exercise. So we took this right to humans and disappointingly what we saw was that unlike the, G the, the rosy glitazone, the GLP-1 targeting in people did not impact VO2 peak, but it did decrease parameters of diastolic of cardiac diastolic dysfunction and vascular function. So we next said, okay, well, let's learn more about that cardiac and vascular dysfunction. Because as we think about the exercise stress, it presents a complex you know, challenge. And so we've got this systemic adaptation. We know that insulin sensitivity fits in, and we know that it requires a blood flow response. So how might insulin action and blood flow tie this together. So we came up with a model, which we now are taking directly in the next few minutes, I'm gonna tell you about studies in human, where we looked at how type two diabetes leads to cardiac dysfunction, systolic and diastolic. Type two diabetes decreases insulin action and muscle mitochondrial function, but what all ties this together? So we decided to focus both on large vessels as well as on the capillary networks. And so I'm gonna tell you the story that we evolved here in some really kind of cool human experiments. So we're moving from humans to cells, to animals and back to humans. Okay, so here is the systems biology with exercise, the lungs, the heart, the, the muscle, the muscle mitochondria. So Dr. Regensteiner is a courageous scientist and she uh, and Jean Wolfel came up with an incredible set of experiments where they said they invited people with early diabetes and control participants to come to the cath lab, have a right heart cath placed, and then we measured their pulmonary vascular wedge pressure while we had them come up to the clinical research center on an exercise bike. And we saw an increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is consistent with increased left-sided pressures or diastolic dysfunction. But we were very interested, or I was specifically interested in whether this, these are new, newly diagnosed people with diabetes. Is this more about the blood flow or the heart muscle dysfunction per se? So we used a Cestamibia nuclear scan where we looked at blood flow across the heart in response to this exercise stress. And the people, with diabetes hardly improved their blood flow and in some cases didn't. They didn't have any obstructive lesions. They just didn't have a great blood flow response or cardiac flow reserve to the, to the exercise stimulus. Their cardiac output was not any different but they did show us some systemic vascular resistance and in increased blood pressures. So we, we did the same kind of an approach in the skeletal muscle. So we said, okay, well, we, we have Doppler to measure blood flow. We have um, near infrared spectroscopy to measure capillary blood flow. We have muscle biopsy where we can measure oxidative, um, oxidative cap capacity. And we also have MRI where we can measure in vivo oxidative capacity. So in collaboration with a group of incredible people, Melanie Kriegreen brought these strategies to us. And then we have Kristen Nadeau, Amy Hipsman, and Irene Schauer. And we take an individual and we put them in the, in the magnet, in the MRI magnet. We have them push down on the pedal for 90 seconds. They let up. And what happens when they let up, we've depleted their high energy phosphates. And then we measure the rates at which they can recover their high energy phosphates, ATP and phosphocreatin. 
And this, the MRI gives us this spectra. And this is the spectra we get. This is the depletion of the high energy phosphates, and this is the recovery. And what we found, as had previously been reported in older and more complicated people with diabetes, is that in people with diabetes, uncomplicated, we saw a decreased phosphocretin um, uh, uh, production. We, it was longer to turn over from that ADP to ATP. And overall, oxidative phosphorylation and Qmax, which are calculated values, were decreased. In some experiments that I won't show you, we did a muscle biopsy. We measured the mitochondrial respiration in, in, in those muscle biopsies. And there was a slight numerical difference and, a, and some of the mitochondrial enzymes were slightly down, but the fiber types were not different. And it was pretty modest mitochondrial effect in the skeletal muscle. So we asked the question, well, is this all driven by the muscle itself, or might this be similar to what we saw in the heart, where it may be more about blood flow? So we took advantage, and this is one of those times when you think of a crazy experiment and it just happens and it works, um, uh, which is we thought, well, we live in Denver. People have a somewhat low oxygen tension, and particularly in the muscle. And if we give them supplemental oxygen while they're in the MRI machine, could we just front load with oxygen? And what we found was that we had an increase in oxygen um, available in the oxygen tension within the muscle. And as a little hint that something might be amiss, we actually increased the, the, the tissue hemoglobin, meaning we slightly increased the blood flow by putting oxygen on. Now that isn't what should happen if there's no deficit in oxygen, but this happened both in the obese individuals as well as in the people with type two diabetes. And what we saw when we, we then looked next, um, my, my, oh yeah, okay. What we saw when we looked next was that only in the people with type two diabetes did in the gray bar putting oxygen on them, did that improve their, their overall mitochondrial assessments. So this suggested to us that people with diabetes may have a, an, a, an oxygen limitation, which is usually not seen until you have severe peripheral vascular disease or heart failure. So this was something, well, that seems like a target. We could train them and we did in fact train them and I'm not gonna show you those data today. And we normalized this, we're able to increase and there was a really lovely sex difference, which we can have Dr. Becky Scalzo come to this conference and talk about at some time in the future. So how did we then drill down to what might be going on in the muscle? So we used a non-invasive technique called near-infrared spectroscopy where you can measure deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. And when a person with, with a normal exercise function um, starts to exercise, you'll see an increase in the overall hemoglobin in the muscle. That makes sense, increased blood flow in the muscle. You will see a depletion of oxyhemoglobin and an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. And if everything was being extracted evenly across the muscle, this should be a lovely uh, surrogate for uh, VO2 peak. And in people, in our obese control subjects in this study, what we saw was this lovely relationship where it looked like the blood was coming in and being deoxygenated evenly across the muscle. And that went along with their VO2 peak. But in the people that live with type two diabetes, what we found was that this relationship was lost. And so we did a number of other studies uh, in animal models to look at uneven blood flow distribution. And what we found was that, that in diabetes, you can see a sloughing of the glycocalyx and a and an uneven blood flow distribution when we do intravital microscopy. And we're trying to see in a BA uh, basic merit study that is still ongoing, whether treating with either GLP-1 or manipulating the GLP-1 axis, or just delivering nitric oxide to the skeletal muscle to this area of hypoxia, which is gonna be a very good uh, reductant area. So if we deliver nitrite or NO2, we may be able to deliver nitric oxide just directly and augment that blood flow. 
So this is the model that we're working with right now, but we've moved this from vascular dysfunction to vascular inflexibility, that the, vas the vasculature, both, both those large vessels, which I showed you were stiff, and the smaller vessels and the capillaries don't respond in a coordinated and effective fashion to the onset of an exercise challenge, as we showed you with the, the Sestamibi scan, as well as with a different, uh, very, very low-tech model of plethysmography. So this just would say that now what's happening is that both the heart and the skeletal muscle, I have this uneven blood flow, and I'm aware of time, I have this uneven blood flow. And when that uneven blood flow is, is how, how is that affecting this premature mortality? Well, it turns out that exercise capacity and particularly sedentarism will affect almost every organ in, in, in the body. And so, and so it's not only is it a systemic marker, but it has a systemic effect on so many tissues. And we have people within our lab studying almost every one of these, of these tissues. I'm gonna close with just an exciting slide from, well, what can I do about this? So we have an exercise training study that we call the VA mix study. I have dyslexia, so I'm not sure what the acronym stands for, even though it's my study with Dr. Reagan Steiner. And what we've done is 4D MRI cardiac imaging, as well as 2D PCI and 4D MRI um, imaging of aortic stiffness. And what we've seen is that compared to controls, both people with obesity and diabetes have a decreased um, uh, L, uh, left ventricular um, and systolic and diastolic volume, so a stiff heart that is also thick. They have aortic stiffness, and when we and when we do exercise training, we can see improvements in the cardiac function as well as the aortic function. And so the model that we're working with right now is that this aortic stiffness may feed backward. This is a, a pulse tracing of what you would see in your aorta versus the ventricle, et cetera, and may give backward to create a pressure on the heart and forward to create pressure on the microcirculation in the end organs, muscles being what we're following. So I'm gonna close here with our model that diabetes um, leads to uh, cardiac dysfunction and skeletal muscle dysfunction in part because of microvascular dysfunction, which we have termed um, vascular inflexibility, that this is driven by decreased DNOS uh, activity and, insulin, and decreased insulin action, and that exercise training can begin to reverse this. So once again, I'm going to thank all of the incredible team that I work with, and I think we have Two minutes left for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Roos, for that fascinating talk. And I actually do have a question. And you remember way back when, when we were looking at oxidative stress in mm -hmm. uh, the aorta blood vessels of uh, type one diabetic mm -hmm. mouth models, that one of the culprits that we were looking at was NADPH oxidase. So my question mm -hmm. to you, I mean, you talk about decreased ENOS, but as you know, you know, uh, uh, when superoxide reacts with Absolutely. NO, you actually can also deplete the NO. So do you know what the state of NADPH oxidase is in type to diabetics? Uh... So, so it, it is increased, although it's probably not the main pro-oxidant um, in, in, in that situation, uh, but there is definitely scavenging uh, due to reactive oxygen species and work that uh, Eva Grayek and, and Amy Keller have been doing together um, uh, to, to, to show that even if I did generate that nitric oxide, it might not get to the right place at the right time, which is why we're so excited about mm -hmm. delivering nitrite to get that mm -hmm. NO only where it goes and to like maybe have it be active because it can also act on the end organ itself to stimulate mm -hmm. mitochondrial biogenesis and maybe more like what rosiglitazone does, although not sure. And I, I don't see anybody um, asking another question, but I do have another question. And <laughs> you uh, mentioned that, you know, hemoglobin levels actually are affected by exercise. Do you know if there's a defect in the oxygen binding capacity of hemoglobin in type two diabetics? Well, I mean, do they have the capacity so, to make BPG or? Yeah. 
So, so Frank Danino um, and others, um, I think at Kansas, have looked at uh, what it is that diabetes does to the to the ability of, um, of hemoglobin to let go of oxygen. So there's some stiffening of the red blood cells, which may decrease effective delivery, but they're also it's somewhat controversial about whether they respond as well to ADP to release the oxygen. Um, and so it, there are some data from a, a Sprague's group that look really exciting. And then it just kind of disappeared and uh, naysayers in the literature. I'm not really sure about that, but if you can't even get it there, it kind of doesn't mm -hmm. So we got to first get it there, and then we can solve these other problems. Um, uh, and um, Mark Gladwin has some very exciting work about, um, and, and Dave Irwin, about other vehicles to try to get the oxygen where it needs to be, when it needs to be there. Yeah, no, I was wondering more along the metabolic uh, abnormalities, as you know, the glycolytic pathway that gives you right. B, which is important. Right, and I think it's going to be more through purine um, signaling than it specifically those pathways, although I will just, you know, go back to the fact that all of those pathways get mucked up by a higher basal level of ROS, which is just the, the con chronic situation. Okay, thank you very much. And I don't see any other questions here and we're uh, out of time. So again, okay. thank you to both Dr. Tennis and Dr. Rouge for these incredibly fascinating talks and very exciting. I mean, we're finally mm -hmm. moving that needle. So thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thank you for having us. Bye.